Good morning. This is Caroline Kotze. I'm the President and Chief Quality Officer at Women in Governance. Welcome to this Global Leaders for Parity session. It is an immense pleasure for us today to have global leaders that are making an impact in their industry, the aerospace. So I will begin without further ado, introducing our panelists and diving into our panel session, which is going to last for about 45 minutes, followed by a 15 minute period of Q&A. So please feel free to ask all your questions and our, our um, VP of operations will be happy uh, to take your questions and present them to the panel at the end of the session. So, Denis Genji, the president of Rolls-Royce Canada is with us. Joined by Maria de la Posta, President at Pratt & Whitney Canada, and Marc Parent, President at CAE Inc. It is an immense pleasure to have such distinguished leaders with us today uh, to speak about a very important topic, not only at Women in Governance, but I think we will all agree, a very important topic globally, the place of women, the leadership, the female leadership, especially in male-dominated industries, and how we can all work together women and men at closing the gender gap in the workplace. So while there has been a lot of progress in your industry, I think we will all agree that it remains highly male dominated. And my first question will go to all four of our panel, all three of our panelists, and it's around the reason why you have personally chosen this cause, why you have accepted my invitation to speak here today. So why is gender parity in the corporate world so important to you as a leader? And what are the benefits to your organization? So I will begin with our female leader here, Maria de la Posta. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, delighted to be here with my colleagues, uh, Dennis and Mark. This is a real pri privilege. So thanks for the opportunity. Well, you know, for me, gender parity is as much about diversity of thought as anything else. and. Um, I believe that that's what makes a team stronger in all areas. First of all, it, you know, it's not just a belief. I think it's my experience. You know, in a global complex world with all the change that's going around us and the pace of change of technology, this requires collaboration and people coming together, thinking differently. Uh, personally, my, you know, my first uh, experience at McGill when I got to be exposed to a whole new community of people, I knew right then I wanted more of that. And then, you know, as a leader and, and proud in Canada, you know, I'm committed to making leadership a, 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 you know, a main focus of my attention because as proud as I am of my successes, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing that next generation of top talent making their way. And, you know, if I can make time to, to help them along the way, that's what I really believe in. And I do believe it's about bringing everybody along, all colors, sizes, shapes, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm very, very proud of the track record of Pride Canada. We've gone from a one product family to a 12 product family and becoming a global leader. I think it's been a competitive advantage to have the, the team that we have and diversity amongst us. Absolutely, competitive advantage. And I think it's something that more and more organizations are understanding. So they all want to reap the benefits from having you know, equal representation of men and women at every level of, uh, of their organization. But it's leaders like like the three of you that are actually doing something about it and and and, and sharing their experience. So we really appreciate uh, your presence. And by the way, we have hundreds of people from all over the globe uh, on the uh, uh, discuss listening to our discussion here today, which is why although the three of us are Montreal based, we've chosen to to do the panel discussion in English uh, just to be uh, to ensure that the most people can take advantage of all the great advice that you guys have to share. Um, Mark, would you like to, to jump in in terms of the reasons why you as a leader have chosen to talk about this topic and the positive impact to your organization? Uh, oui, merci, Caroline. On fait pas ça en français? <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just, just a joke. Sorry, I think I might have missed your opening comments. I hope I didn't miss uh, too much. Uh, the uh, usual staff who, uh, even though we do this all, all day, the time that we need the audio to work, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, but I, I heard Maria. It's great to see Mar Maria and Dennis, uh, and Denny on the line, and, and, and really participated with all your 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 uh, your members here listening to us on the call. Look to me, gender parity to me, diversity. It, it's just normal. It's, it's what it has to be. To you know, I tell stakeholders all the time, whether it be employees, shareholders, that 
you know, this is the right thing to do. You know, I have three kids and last I have two daughters. Uh, to me, it's, it's personal. I don't want my son to have more opportunities than me uh, in life you know, because he's a man. Uh, it, it shouldn't be that way. It certainly wasn't the way it was in my family. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, I influence, uh, I have a very matriarchal mother. Maybe that influenced my, <laughs> my view, which probably explains why I have four very strong women on my management team. And uh, I think that's very helpful. I, to me, it's no other way. And, and for a business, it, it to me is absolutely critical because you you want, first of all, you want to be able to tap into the full talent pool of, or, of the organization to grow your business. And so to me, having balanced gender uh, diversity in organization, you know, it can only improve our performance, decision making and, and creating a culture, which I'm very proud that we have, where people feel valued for an individual uh, contribution, no matter who they are, no matter what gender they are, no matter what race they are, and they're fully represented in the organization. And that just demonstrates to what point the tone at the top is important because I'm listening to you, listening to Maria, and, and realizing to what extent when you've got passionate leaders such as you, things actually happen, things change. And if, if, not, you know, if there's no concrete and real action taken, then you know, we're just going to, to, to be stuck. So thank you so much for your leadership on that, uh, Mark. Uh, Denis? You are on mute, Denis. The joys of technology in this new era. We're all, we're all getting used to it. So, uh, you can, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So again, thanks again, Kellen, for the invitation. And like uh, the other panelists as well, great to be with Maria and Mark as well uh, on this panel. I think similar to what they both said, I think what's important to me is that everyone has the opportunity to fulfill their potential regardless of their gender. Right? Otherwise, so much talent gets you know, wasted or overlooked. And you know, we've, got, we've got to create those conditions for this to, to happen, and it's a, you know, that is the root of achieving you know, gender parity. I mean, we all know that it, you know, having gender parity across our own businesses you know, leads to more rounded and more productive workforce, and, and what we're looking for is diversity of opinion, right? I mean, better, more perspectives leads to better decisions, and we've all read the statistics you know, from all these consultants and whatnot about having diverse management, and I think that you know, I just came across something uh, last week from the Boston Consulting Group talking about, you know, diverse management teams have 19% higher revenue uh, due to innovation. And, innovation. and aerospace is all about innovation. So we've just got to keep on doing it. And like Mark said, you know, no matter what the, the gender, race, whatever, everybody's got to have the same opportunities. And we've seen a lot of impacts from increasing the amount of women that we have in our teams as well in terms of bottom line. And we can compare ourselves to other sites. So, I mean, we're, we're thrilled with results. And it really hasn't has had an impact on our bottom line. And at the end of the day, you're CEOs, and that is something that speaks to you. And that's also why, for the past ten years at Women in Governance, we've always spoken about the value to an organization. You're not just doing this for for women's sake. You're not just doing this because it's the right thing to do. It's the fair thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. So innovation, your branding, your employee engagement, and there's ample statistics also around obviously what's most important is your financial performance and how the presence of more women in leadership roles and diversity as a whole uh, will have an impact. Um, Maria, I'd, li I'd like to go back to you, which with what really um, interests me in, in your profile, Maria, is that first of all, you're a female leader at Pratt & Whitney, you've spent most of your career there and you made it to the top as the president. And, uh, but you're not an engineer. So often we're told, oh, we're in, a, in, in an industry where we can't find the women because there's not enough female graduates in engineering. Um, but that you're recognized as a champion uh, of inclusion and, and leadership development. I'm curious to know what the key to your success is and if you've had any particular obstacles that you've had to overcome to thrive as a woman in the aerospace industry. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm not an engineer, but you know, I, I, on further reflection, I think I must give my mother credit for so many things. But you know, as a kid, uh, I've always been a little on the short side, as I still am today. And uh, you know, lining up to get into school in the morning, you know, they line us all up, and the little ones, uh, you know, at the front of the line and whatever. And invariably, I was always like first or second in line. And you know, my mother never said to me, "You're the smallest one." She always said, "You're the first." And so maybe that's stuck. 
Um, you know, just uh, kidding aside, though, I think uh, having an engineering degree is very valuable, especially in an industry like ours where, you know, customers look to people who have product knowledge. Um, it's definitely a plus. So, um, you know, um, I was, you know, very lucky to have a lot of people along the way who uh, literally drew pictures to help me, you know, get that experience, even though I didn't have the academic background. But I would say, you know, for me, a few things. One, I've always had a, a passion for learning and, you know, even my uh, John, the, the president uh, before me, you know, in my uh, performance appraisals, the one thing is that that desire to always want to learn more about business models, about customers, about people um, is something that I thrive on. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, that opportunities come in many shapes and sizes. And sometimes I find people are stuck on certain paths and things like that. And I, I really, you know, didn't focus on that. I, I always looked for things that were either undefined or had an opportunity for me to apply the skills that I did have to something different and make it be, you know, different than what others had done. Um, you know, to be totally honest, though, I think success is part motivation, part fear. And um, it's easy for me in retrospect to kind of describe my path. Uh, but in reality, you don't know how it's going to play out. And that's why I'm a firm believer in trying as many things as possible. You know, don't be afraid of opportunities that don't look like what you were planning or what you were expecting. You know, there's a saying that goes, opportunity doesn't favor those who sit still. And I believe in that. I think the notion, too, of constant transformation and reinvention, you know, that I was looking for what's next, even when things are good. Uh, again, that's something else that's motivated me a lot over the years. And as a result, I've had the opportunity to pull together you know, interesting teams from across the business. I got to meet people I wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet otherwise. And, and again, I think that whole notion of including and bringing people along, you know, you, you get that bug and you realize, like Mark said, it's, it's normal. That's how you want life to be. And, you know, welcome change. As, as terrible as this pandemic is and all the adverse impact it's going to have on the economy and our business, you know, there will be things that come out of that, opportunities, you know, and this is an opportunity for people to raise their hand, you know, and the more junior you are in your career, the, the smaller the bet. So I, I think, you know, I encourage, you know, people that I talk to with that. Um, you know, as far as obstacles are concerned, well, yeah, not being an engineer in aerospace, you know, probably meant that th things took a little longer uh, and, you know, Perhaps I was underestimated and uh, people like to make assumptions on my behalf. And a fair amount of it was also self-imposed. You know, I'm a mother, I have a son, and for sure the guilt of, you know, the choices that you make, your career over your family or what feels like it sometimes, but it does come down to, you know, quality time. So I think fortunately for me, I had a lot of mentors who helped me with those obstacles from uh, my parents who, you know, just gave me unbelievable tools, you know, even though it was a, sort of a traditional upbringing, they never put me in a box. So I never went into things with sort of those stereotypes in mind. Um, I had siblings, I have siblings. My sister taught me how to read or write before I even started grade one. So, you know, set me on the right foot. The girlfriends I grew up with, I knew they had my back. And then here at Pratt, I worked with some amazing leaders. And I think Dennis and, and Mark know most of them who, uh, pushed me, pushed me hard. Um, and the company was also there, you know, when I needed coaching, because I, you know, I'm not perfect. And there was probably a thing or two that needed work and still does. And, I, you know, we worked for an organization where, you know, people get second chances. And I, I definitely feel very, very privileged and blessed for all the people who've been there and, and helped me overcome those obstacles. It's, um, yeah, it's a daily blessing that I, uh, I'm very grateful for. So you're well surrounded. And uh, these, so you've had mentors, you've had sponsors in your life as well. Am I, I'm guessing, did you get supported by men and women equally? Was it more men who were supporting you along the way? Absolutely. You know, I, I should, you know, my career was not, you know, linear upward. You know, there were bumps along the way and, uh, um, I would say equally men and women were there to support me, whether it was, you know, my parents, both of them brought me different things. Uh, I worked for leaders here who, uh, you know, were all very different. They all taught me something different. Uh, but, you know, you know, just universally, um, 
I would say that, um, you know, I've had great support from both men and women who each taught me different things. And, um, and, and I had the opportunity to reach out to people outside my four walls, like I said, with my coaching and things like that, people who can look at, at things a little bit more independently and, and sometimes give you the, you know, the wake-up call or lurges that, um, you know, we all need from time to time. But I, I would say that, yeah, I, I was blessed with having great mentors and coaches and not in the sort of uh, organized way, right, but people who took an interest in me from when I was a kid. That's wonderful. Uh, that brings me to my next question to our male panelists in terms of mentoring. Um, have you been uh, in a position where you have changed, have made an impact in a woman's life by mentoring her, by coaching her, bringing her up the ladder? Would you like to jump in, Mark? Yeah, I think maybe from a broader point of view, I think, well, first of all, look, to me, I, I would I would point to some of the things that uh, Maria said, right? And, you know, I've had the pleasure of, and, and, uh, of working, uh, you know, in one way or another with Maria, uh, better for 25 years, doesn't seem that long, but <laughs> the, <laughs> I, I, by the way, if you know her, you could not tell that she's not an engineer. I think she's a closet engineer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think about the story that Maria talked about, it, and we all see it, people that have risen in your organization, women that have risen in your organization, uh, and, and you know, have, have are extraordinary, are extraordinary because they've had to overcome obstacles that, you know, men don't have to, because a lot of, they, there's no question being asked. It, these whole issues that, we, you know, we should, I think collectively we feel ashamed of, that a woman in order to succeed in her career uh, ha, should feel guilt about having to, you know, uh, be away from their, for, for kids. I mean, to me, those are the things, to me, as leaders, we have to take, uh, if we want an outcome, which is better diversity, better gender diversity, we we can't just talk. We have to have concrete things that we do, just like any other strategy that we have in our business. You can establish the strategy, establish a goal, but then you have a path to what exactly are you going to do to make that happen and then measure that that's happening. And that, that's how we do business. It should be no different. And for me, mentorship, your question, is just one of the elements, one of them. So to that point, we just talk about, you know, certainly my career, I've had many uh, opportunities to do that. And, and, and me, it's, I would certainly mentor women specifically uh, because of the fact that they have overcome these obstacles. Uh, but, but to me, uh, I, I, I believe it's happening to force multiply. So force multiply means that at CA, we put together a mentorship program that where more than 100 women at CA have went through this program in Canada, and we're now taking it globally. And that mentorship program that people learned that women work on their, on their networking, on their confidence, on the ability to take risks, put yourself out there. You know, something, men a lot of times are 20% ready to say, I'm ready. Women are 90%. It's my, my experience, not to establish cliches, my experience that if they're 90 percent sure they still think they're not good enough <laughs> we have to talk to mentor about things like that so i could go on and on but a number of things that we put in place uh leadership program we put a program in place just in the in the past uh you know 18 months we call the dare program and it's designed it's a leadership program we have a lot of leadership development programs as he but this one is specifically targeted for women only and basically giving them a Spanish over a year. It's very, very intensive. And it's had it involves conferences, webinar discussions, assigned mentors specifically to help them individually. We have a, a program called Leap, where again, we develop the, the our future training centers because we have training centers around the world. We have about seven. We want, and we found to the point that was raised by Denis, but you know, how women can be effective in growing their top line. We have found specifically that those centers that we have women in charge do disproportionately well. And, and you know, in a male dominated pilot world, having that dynamic in a world that doesn't have enough women pilots, that's very, very strong and strong motivation. So our program is there to develop not only women as training center leaders, but what I'm proud to say is that of our graduates now, 50% are women. And 
again, just maybe I want to say them all, but we have a program, one of our leadership development programs called the Ken Patrick program after our founder, which is we take people literally out of school on a, a, a program that a lot of companies have where we move around every six months to a different department. And after two years, they get a leadership job, a, a management job after two years in the organization. Now, what, I'm, what we do now is that we ensure that 50% of the graduates going into that in the engineering program specifically are women. You have to force things sometimes. And those are kind of the actions we're taking to make that which, and of course, mentoring is a big part. It's quite, it's quite huge and remarkable, everything that you've achieved at, at CAE, Mark. And, uh, you know, um, not everybody knows, but there is that uh, only 5% of pilots that are women. And so programs like those that you are talking about, there's this, um, program that you launched, I believe, last year uh, that has had also a huge impact on the number of women who choose this uh, this discipline. You've got bursaries, I believe, as well that are given out. Yeah, absolutely. Look, the statistic that you mentioned, I mean, it's ridiculous that only 5% of airline pilots flying the world, uh, the world's airlines today are women. It doesn't make any sense. And, and I, I'm sure all of us at some point have been uh, gone on uh, on the plane, and somebody usually they're they're older. They say, "Oh, it's a woman flying the plane," and somehow intimating they're maybe not safe or something. I mean, it's crazy. So, so we, I mean, go, going into this panic, uh, pandemic, there was going to be a shortage, and and I believe there still will be there still will be a shortage. By the way, there is a hiatus, but people will fly again. Let's not worry about that. It's the the fact is. The industry needs women pilots to again to address the full talent pool uh, that's out there. So we we decide to you know push this forward by selecting and and funding full scholarships for for deserving women from around the world that, uh, that make a proposal to us, which is in this format, video format, to, to demonstrate to us why they think they should be airline pilots. They have no experience. We start from scratch. And we take them and we partner with airlines that we fund their whole, you know, development. That's that's over a quarter of a million dollars a piece. And before they become airline pilots over a period of two years, and then they are hired by an airline around the world. So we fund this. We've already funded five. We're going to do it again this year because you got to put your money, you know, where your heart and where, where your goals are. And that's what we're doing. here. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Denis, um, if you would uh, speak to, first of all, the mentoring of women within your organization or outside your organization, you're also a mentor at Women in Governance, uh, at our own uh, uh, mentoring program, which, by the way, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to uh, inform you that our program is now going virtual and it will stay uh, that way even post-COVID because our goal has always been to expand it into other regions. This is going to be a very easy and a safe way to do so. So across Canada, the States, and we're also looking at Europe. And so we will need maybe your colleagues uh, at Rolls-Royce in the UK to uh, to jump in as, uh, as mentors as well. So if you can share uh, your experience as a mentor and why you're doing this, and then we can talk about certain, some of the things that uh, Rolls-Royce has put in place. Yeah, I mean, uh, so like you said, I've uh, mentored people both internally and externally. Uh, I think it comes back to what Maria said as well, is that, you know, I think early on in my career, the assumption that people would just take care of me in my career because I was a, a bright kid or whatnot isn't always the, the, the case. And also, like Max correctly pointed out, again, not, not to stereotype, but oftentimes men who are not at all ready feel that they can do a job and women will wait until it's 90% plus. It's, it's quite a different dynamic. And I like Maria as well, so I'm, I'm not an engineer. I'm a, I'm a chart accountant by, by trade. Um, and, you know, I think it's the reminder through all this mentoring is that, you know, we have to make sure that people are true to themselves, right? Don't try to adapt yourself to behaviors that you think are uh, the norm and to try to fit in because the reason why you are where you are is because you were yourself and we just have to continue on this whole diversity of approach. Uh, and, you know, what we, we're trying to stay away from is, you know, groupthink or herd mentalities. Um, and I think that to take Maria's example as well, I mean, you know, my, my mother was a huge influence for me in that, you know, it was always, you know, I was a shy kid uh, growing up, if you can believe that. Um, and you know, she, she would always say, just go out and ask the question, and the worst that will happen is someone will say no. 
you start to realize that if you ask and ask and ask, uh, at one point, you may end up hitting 5%, 10%, it becomes 50% after a while, so there's got to be perseverance as well, because I have no doubt that, you know, Maria and Mark as well, on their road to where they've gotten to today, and myself as well, we've all faced obstacles, but you just have to persevere through all of this. And I guess as a mentor, it's your role to help uh, women navigate and overcome any obstacles that they may encounter uh, by acting, I think, as, as their advocates and, and level the playing field where it doesn't appear to be level. I mean, we, we've got that in each of our teams, right? People that are maybe a bit more talkative and those that aren't as talkative. Well, I make sure that everybody who's on, you know, in a panel and a team gets their turn to, to speak. And you talk about, you know, changing the dynamic. I know here at Rolls-Royce now, you know, you're right that it's still aer a male-driven industry that is aerospace. But if I look at my senior most engineers, the top five engineering roles that I have here in Canada, four out of the five of them are held by women. And you know what, we have probably one of the strongest engineering teams across the world, and it's recognized as that. Uh, you know, there's, there's no debating the fact that the fact that we have those women at the top as well is helping us significantly. So I think that, you know, it's important that we continue doing this and, and helping out wherever we can, um, because in, you know, in terms of competencies, I think it really just comes down to your level of engagement. Uh, you know, I think that for me, barring, you know, technical requirements, and obviously the roles that, that uh, we have here in aerospace are very technical roles, whether it's engine simulators or whatnot, but again, people skills are key to lead. And I think that making sure people get out there and are credible, having teams support them and follow them, I think are really, really important. So I think engagement is probably one of the most important criteria that I try to uh, instill on people that I, I mentor, um, um, you know, whether at Rolls-Royce or externally as well. That, that, that's wonderful, uh, Denis, and, and thank you for all that you do and for being uh, such a good friend uh, with, uh, with our team at Women in Governance. Um, Rolls-Royce is uh, doing particularly well in Asia, it seems. Um, there's a, a leader, uh, a country lead in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And uh, one of your five global hubs is Singapore, also 20% uh, of women uh, in the senior management roles uh, are, are women there. So that's, that's quite remarkable. And uh, we, we also uh, were informed that uh, they in partnered with the Singapore Girl Guides to launch a science investigator badge and inspire girls to take an interest in science and technology. Um, do you think this is something that we might replicate here in Canada? I mean, absolutely, I and mean, there's, still, there's still a lot more to be done, and I think, like I said, I think we have a reasonable track record of female representation uh, at our management level. I mean, even within our executive team before some key retirements, about a third of, the, of, of our exec team was made up of women. Like I said, 80% of our senior managers, um, are, the most senior managers are, are, in, are engineering, sorry, are women, and right now about half of my engineering population in management is also women. Uh, like I said, probably the highest ones across Rolls-Royce. I think the opportunity that we have is just to get out in the community like Singapore did and to reach out to young girls who may not even be, be considering uh, such a career at this point. Uh, and they need role models, role models to emulate, to follow in their footsteps, uh, to give them those, those opportunities. I think what our roles are, and I think that collectively within aerospace, we've done a lot of work on that, still a lot more to do just to open up and uh, those possibilities so people can understand what's available out there that they may not, may not even know exists. I'll give you a really good example. Earlier this year, uh, we partnered with uh, Montréal Relève uh, to create a video uh, to promote non-traditional roles uh, and trades to high school girls. And that's been put out. I think the feedback I received was, was really, really good. And one of our top mm -hmm. inspectors here on the floor was, uh, is, a, is a woman and she's the one who participated. And it just goes to show that, you know, there are people out there, but I think there's a lot of, again, people just go back to traditions instead of being aware of what is the potential. And that's our role to continue doing that, uh, whether what Singapore did, what we've done here in Montreal, uh, and we've done that across aerospace as well. We just got to continue doing that sort of work to get even more women into uh, both engineering and aerospace in general, because I think like you've heard so far, they have made a huge difference in our companies. Exactly, and I was particularly interested with the Girl Guides uh, experience with, with Rolls Royce in Singapore because at Women in Governance, we have actually launched a huge partnership with the Girl Scouts of the USA. And so you may have seen our, our announcement uh, 
which was unfortunately right before COVID hit, but we're still very much on track with that project. So the Girl Scouts of the USA is a $1.2 billion organization, and they've decided to use the power of the purse to have their vendors align with their values. So while they are preparing girls for tomorrow's world, we are preparing the world for these girls. So we're working with their vendors to do the parity certification and ensure that you know the hard earned uh, dollars uh, from the Girl Scouts go into organizations that will allow them to come in and progress without sticky floors, without glass ceilings. And it's uh, interesting to note that the CEO at the Girl Scouts of the USA, Sylvia Tevito, she's a former uh, rocket scientist at NASA. So she's put in place a lot of programs, uh, STEM programs, to encourage girls to uh, get more interested in these disciplines. So we're, we're very proud uh, of, uh, of this partnership. So talking about parity certification, all three of your organizations have enrolled in the program. Uh, I'd like to give uh, the floor to Maria because uh, Pratt & Whitney has actually achieved a very great progress over the past couple of years. Um, yeah, well, I, very interesting. Well, I'm, 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 you know, delighted that the program is there because I think, you know, the first step in, in improvement is acknowledging, you know, where you are and, and getting to know what others are doing so that you can improve your own efforts. But um, yes, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, it's more than a decade now that we launched our Women uh, Leadership Conference, which was really um, an offshoot of having looked at our leadership development process and realizing that, you know, as we were developing succession plans and, and you know, talking about uh, female candidates, there was always this recurring, well, you know, she doesn't come out of her sandbox enough. And, you know, there seemed to be this sort of repeat message of, you know, w talented women who had achieved unbelievable results. In some cases, were lo leading some of the biggest units. And yet there was sort of like this constant sort of profile that didn't seem to fit the mold. And I, I got to give a lot of credit to John at the time who said, you know what, we're going to go understand this a little bit better. And we launched the conference at the time just to really go and, and create awareness. And, um, you know, you asked earlier about, you know, was I supported by men or women or both? And at the time, I, I give a lot of credit to, to my male colleagues, you know, Kevin Walter, who became executive sponsors of the process with me. But as it relates to this uh, certification, um, like I said, I think, you know, in 2018, we, we looked at, you know, what we had done and, and I think our results are good. You know, we have 30 to 35 percent of uh, women in the various executive ranks uh, and we have a good pipeline, but, you know, it's not 50 percent. But so we did a few things. We launched a number of programs from, uh, you know, affirming our commitment to, to P4P, which is 50 percent, um, you know, women by 2030. Uh, a whole host of programs around flexibility and work-life balance. We evolved our mentoring and coaching programs to include sponsorship, which is the notion of speaking on one's behalf, you know, because what you find is that, you know, our pool is, is pretty solid, but the, there's a, a gap between the, the junior levels and the more senior levels. And that's where, you know, you need leaders like, like us that are speaking on behalf of people when opportunities come up, when uh, teams are being set up. So that was a big, big part of it. And a lot of training around biases. We also looked at the structure. You know, what, what, what is it about our organization, the way we're organized or, or the expectations that we set that maybe needed to be adapted? Um, you know, a lot has been said about the importance of role models. And I, I think that's a big one. You know, when you see people that look like you or that, you know, you want to aspire to be uh, like them, you know, it, it helps make the journey a little bit more real for yourself. And, uh, you know, when I look at the results, it's not just the numbers, you know, we can talk about percentages, but what I'm particularly proud of is that we have female representation across every discipline of the organization, from engineering to operations, to customer service, to marketing, to business development, to key functions like finance, HR, and legal, the top jobs are, are held by women in those areas. Uh, so I think that's very important, you know, to get out of some of the traditional sort of profiles that we've looked at over time. And, um, you know, something that uh, the Women's Leadership uh, Conference, I think, has transformed itself many, many times. 
uh, to go from awareness to education, great, great learnings, but also outreach. And I think, you know, we owe a big um, amount of our time to the youth because, you know, all the things that my colleagues have talked about uh, here this morning is reaching, you know, people when they're young, you know, when they're little, you know, taking that, you know, moment to not make that comment that puts your daughter in a box, you know, or, or, or son, you know, I mean, you know, being who you, who you are meant to be. Um, and I think, you know, doing things like FIRST Robotics, all the STEM activities, but more importantly, just taking a personal interest in young people and children, and a little seed, you know, can help them see something they wouldn't have otherwise seen. I think that's, it, it, it's all of that, right? And we need to put a focus on day-to-day -day activities, even with me in my position. You know, when we do salary evaluation, merit, grades, you know, there are biases that creep in all the time, and it, you need to be vigilant. Well, kudos from progressing from bronze to gold in two years, uh, Maria and Craig Whitney team. I'm really very proud of that. And we had announced oh. it at, at our gala um, in both Montreal and Toronto. It's, it's extremely exciting when it comes from an organization, uh, you know, in a male-dominated industry. And as you said, it's not just about numbers. It's also about what else do you do? What policies do you put in place? What initiatives do you take? What leadership are you playing, even outside of your organization, within the industry? And what important element you said, you know, the girls and the boys. And that's extremely important because we tend to think that we're only doing this for the girls. But at the end of the day, keep in mind that not all boys want to be CEOs. Not all boys want to be strong and brave and, 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 uh, and work hard. They may decide that for them, their passion is to actually take care of the kids at home. And we can see that a lot of the men in the corporate world are, you know, sometimes doing what they feel is expected of them because they are male. And that it might be more difficult to say, you know what, I want to take time off. I've just had a baby. So it's implementing these policies to make it okay, but it's also implementing the right culture for them to feel safe to actually take that time off and, and take care of the baby. Um, so, so thank you and congratulations. And I'll just say a quick hello to Kevin Smith, your VP of HR, my friend for over 20 years. Um, I'd uh, also now uh, would like to open the floor on what you feel, because all three of you have gone through the certification uh, process. The three organizations have, have been in there uh, some uh, multiple years. Uh, we also have Bombardier that has joined us for the next three years. Um, unfortunately, Eric Martel couldn't join us, but he will be with us uh, next year. He, as you all know, has recently joined Bombardier and Bombardier has recently joined the certification process. But I have to say we're extremely touched by the number of organizations such as you that during a pandemic do understand that we need to keep our eye on the ball. You can't just say, oh, we've got other problems to, to resolve. And you all do. You're all working through, uh, you know, the COVID uh, situation with our employees across the country. It's not an easy situation for anyone. And so to take an hour of your busy agendas and to be here speaks volume. And I think, you know, hundreds of people have registered and I know a lot from your organizations as well. So I think that they will, uh, you know, be very proud to see how their leaders are uh, behaving uh, in times like these. Do you um, have any uh, last advice, uh, Dennis or Mark, around what leaders can do to attract more women uh, within, their, within their organization, whether it's male dominated or not? But I mean, there are ways that you can position your, your, your company as a, a friendly place for women if you want to attract and retain uh, female talent and diverse, you know, I, I, I will even open it up beyond just women because we also have a whole intersectionality uh, element to the certification because we all know that certain women, uh, immigrants or uh, indigenous or, 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 or um, um, black women have other obstacles to surmount besides like Maria and myself who are you know, uh, white women, they also have uh, additional obstacles. So what do you do to attract that type of uh, candidates to your organization? Uh, if I could, if I could just start, uh, Mark, uh, to me, uh, it's very important to use our role models in your organization. We, uh, we all, just by uh, the, the actions you've, you've talked about and what we've achieved, we all have role model uh, women and, and, and also people that are other uh, groups in that can act as real role models and that's 
it, it becomes a lot easier to when you can to attract what you can walk to talk and for women to see women that are in positions of authority uh, and responsibly to organization you know i i look at what Denis done with four or five women leading his organize, engineering organization that's fantastic when you think about it, i think it's 20 percent uh, a women coming out of engineering school that's a fantastic example of a role model to put out there and, and to me like i'm very proud as i just repeating i said a while ago i had four very very uh you know uh strong women leaders in my organization and you know they're not 70 years old <laughs> you know they're women in the organization and outside can see hey you know there's somebody that has achieved a, a position in an organization a, a global organization uh here in montreal that you know i could aspire in my career to do that i can do that and have them talk about it and, and another important thing uh before i leave the, the floor uh, is that beware of your unconscious bias <laughs> because mm -hmm. you know and we've done a lot of training we're continuing to do that we're rolling it out globally and i'll give you a, an anecdote which i found very telling is you know i won't say who it is but someone at the uh a, one of my female leaders in the organization who's just probably strongest advocate from the beginning of our diversity inclusion. When she went through the unconscious bias training, she said, got the result and says, oh my God, I'm, I have unconscious bias against women. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't necessarily know how we act and how that might, you know, affect things in, in a way that we don't even, you know, uh, understand. So leave it, uh, leave it to that. Yeah, unconscious, exactly. The word said that it's, it's, uh, it's striking how women can also have these bias relative to other women. It's not it's not just the man far from that. Uh, thank you, Mark. And um, actually, I also wanted to share the fact that, as I mentioned, we've launched in the States and that we're in discussion with your uh, American operations uh, to have CAE certify on the other side of the border as well. So discussions have been uh, taken on for the past uh, few months. And so we're hopeful uh that um in 2020 we'll be able to announce that CAE is not only certified on the canadian side but on the u.s side the first organization i know we've got a few that are uh in the pipeline but uh we'll uh, we'll see we'll see who begins well we'll look forward to that congratulations for broadening your certification in the united states that's a great thing thank you so much denise yeah i think the one thing i add to mark's point i think it's a really really important point um is that you know, to have these role models visible, I mean, it's something that we've done here as well is to, you know, we talked about increasing opportunities for female candidates. I mean, it's important. We'll make sure we, we interview people, but having selection and the selection process for vacancies, having women on the panel, uh, I think is really important because oftentimes through conscious or unconscious bias, a lot of people end up hiring, you know, what is similar to themselves. So if you have a panel of, of, of white middle-aged men, it may happen that they may hire a white middle-aged man to fill a role. So I think we purposely try to have women as well to make sure they have different perspectives on how we fulfill some of these, these roles that we have in, in the organizations. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do, and I think that Mark has said it and Maria said it as well, you know, making sure that we also publicize, if you want, a lot of the policies that we've set out in the past several years uh, to try to encourage people, and whether it's men or women, I mean, if you remember back a few years back when Quebec launched, um, you know, the parental leave for fathers, it was almost like, what, what, what does that mean? As a father, I can now take some time off of work. Am I allowed to do that? Um, and I think that that whole thinking about having policies that maybe people perceive them as being for women, well, that's not necessarily the case, right? We have parental leave. I mean, there's two parents usually, um, so, you know, that can be shared. So there's a lot of things that we can do to talk about what we have done here to sell the organizations and how they're important for parity moving forward. Love it, fantastic. Um, so it's 12.45 and this is the time for our Q&A session. Um, past 45 minutes was our panel discussion. Now we've got our VP of Global Operations, Nicole Pickett, who is joining us. She's actually an ex-Bombardier employee. so. Uh, still uh, with the aerospace industry, and Nicole has been uh, monitoring questions from the from our global audience, and we'll be jumping in with uh, questions. So go ahead, Nicole, please. Thanks, Caroline, and thanks uh, to our panelists. There's a lot of excitement in the uh, in the chat here. 
Um, one of the questions that's uh, interesting that uh, I wanted to ask is, what is uh, what's your perspective, and this I'd ask to all three of you, on the idea of setting targets or quotas for um, to to accelerate the achievement of gender parity? I'll start if that's um, I, I I'm on, on of two minds on that. I I do think. You know, people say to me, oh, do we really need these ladies' garden clubs anymore, you know? And, and I, my answer to that is, uh, well, women are 50% of the population, no matter how you slice it and dice it, color, shape, sizes, whatever. But we're not 50% of, other than very few, any stratas to speak of, right? Whether, um, you know, uh, disciplines or others. So I think there's additional action. Now, you know, uh, Something that, just to come back to what was said previously, um, at the conference we had, we shared last year with, with CAE actually, Dr. Sabia talked to us about whether they're conscious or unconscious biases, but this physiological aspect of it, which is the brain taking shortcuts. You know, the brain is getting all this data all the time and it can't process everything diligently, so it takes shortcuts. It, and one, one way it does it is it, it tends to lead you down the path of things that look or sound like you, right? So maybe for something trivial, like getting in line to place an order, who cares? But when you're hiring people or you're developing talent, that's not trivial. And so you need to force your, you, you need to have, if not targets, policies that force the issue of having a diverse slate. Now, I do believe it's an end, you know, you know, it's, Promoting women should not be about not promoting men because I think, you know, as has been very recent discussions, we don't want to disenfranchise any group. This is not about, you know, promoting one at the expense of another. This is finding a way to maximize the potential of everyone. So that's why I hesitate a little bit with targets, but I do believe we need actions and we need to continue to shine a light and provide focus to this area because things creep in, you know, and you need to be able to be sensitive to it all the time. I would tend to agree as well from, from that point of view. To have set a target isn't about, in my mind, set or hitting that number, but it's more about, you know, again, going back to this whole unconscious bias that, you know, we know we have corporate targets and therefore we have to make sure we give everybody a fair shot and isn't about just promoting one person over the other because of their gender. But I think it just forces that sort of discussion to take place, which, is, which I think is the, the, the purpose behind setting those targets. So I, I'm with Marie as well. It's a double-edged sword in terms of how you, you work with those targets. They're important, uh, but they're not important just to hit that number at the end if you end up promoting the wrong people for the job because of the gender, which is then no one wins. Yeah, uh, myself, you know, just by what I said, you know, I believe in, in, in some cases, setting quotas because unless you take the you know, definitive action in some cases, you, you're, it's going to take too long to get there. And, and I de definitely agree, uh, you know, with uh, both Denny and Maria that uh, we certainly don't want to, you know, go the other way and disenfranchise other groups, including men, <laughs> that by getting the right promotions that they deserve. But to me, like I, I said before, you know, I... I believe that, okay, that we may have a certain demographic that, let's say, uh, pick a number, 30%, there's only 30% of women, say, coming out of university that have that, you know, that they're represented by 30% in the population pool. Well, I'll be darned if we can't impose a quota that throughout the organization, we're going to have a cylinder that's 30% all the way. And, and so to me, uh, headhunters, you know, uh, recruitment firms, uh, if I'm looking for an outside candidate, you have to present me a slate of candidates that's as diverse as the population pool that's out there. And when we're priming the pump at the start coming out of university, I say, hey, give me 50%. I want to see 50% slate. And uh, and so far, uh, based on the talent that's being shown, that I don't, I haven't seen that driving those those uh, those targets and those quotas have resulted in any kind of erosion of the potential talent we get. Quite the contrary. Yeah, you're right. Nicole, if I can jump in real quick uh, regarding the sure, I would say that um, it's very easy to compare countries, right? So, for instance, if you look at quotas as in legislation, 
of, uh, for instance, women on boards, you would see that in Canada, we have about 21, maybe 22% of women uh, on, on publicly traded boards, which is compared to France, half. France has over 40% of women since 2017 because of the Loi pour les Mermans. So it's quite obvious that it's worked there. But it's also worked in Quebec as well. More than 10 years ago, under Jean Charest's government, there was a, a law for uh, la loi de gouvernance des sociétés d'État. So for uh, crown corporations or uh, sociétés d'État, so I, I'm not sure what the uh, appropriate English is for that. But so our, our utilities, our Hydro Quebec, our SAQ, etc. Have uh, they had to have 50% of uh, of women on their boards? And uh, guess what? They achieved that in uh, less than five years. They went from 20 26% to 51%. So you know, I always say when you legislate, you find the women, and when you don't legislate, you find excuses. So I just wanted to um, to leave that there. Very good point. Um, I think we'll just ask one more question, and this is about um, the youth. Uh, Denis, you mentioned how important it is to start at a young age to try and help to foster, foster young women to be able to consider themselves in roles that have been traditionally held by, by boys and men. Um, what are each of your organizations doing or planning to do to make sure that you've got that, that pipeline of female talent coming from, um, um, from you know, the very youngest ages so that people are, women are seeing themselves or girls are seeing themselves in these roles. I mean, I guess I can kick it off. I think that from, from my point of view here at Rolls-Royce, I mean, you know, whether it's us getting women out, um, you know, in leadership roles, um, out to high schools, even elementary schools, and I know, like I said, within aerospace, and I know Mark and both Maria as well were also involved in, in these initiatives that date back several years to get back to the very, very young levels. I think that it goes back to having uh, access and visibility to women that have performed really well, that have become top mm -hmm. engineers or top of, of Pratt & Whitney Canada. You know, it, it, things out there are, are possible and it's about, to, it's about increasing that visibility to all the people that are there. So opening our doors to host schools and, and whatnot I think is important. Us as well going out there for, uh, if you want, if, for career days or anything else like that. Uh, so it kind of works both ways, but you know we, we have opportunities through media as well that we've done quite a bit putting uh, forward some of our young women engineers too, uh, just to get out there and speak, spread the word that you know this is what's happening as well. We've seen, I mean, I think collectively our numbers have increased, and they need to increase even more. We know that the requirement for STEM is just going to increase year after year after year, and if if we you know if we have half of the population that are women, if we don't target those people, they don't come into that those fields. We are all going to struggle within an in, uh, in industry as well. Yeah, I mean, just to Mark? add to that. Sorry. Yeah, well, I think what I, I would echo with uh, what Denise said, you, you know, just if you think about STEM and uh, engineering specifically, it just so happens in Canada uh, that you know, the population, I think it's about 20% of women come out of engineering schools. That's not necessarily the case. That's not the case in many countries in the world. Many countries in the world, it's 50%. There's absolutely no reason. There's something in the way that we have done things overall uh, from you know, just from the point is starting when, you know, kids are, as Marissa said, our kids, that we have somehow did something that's reinforced the, this, this clivage in our society. It doesn't have to be that. Mm -hmm. But it's for us to change that. We have to get in schools and, and work with guidance counselors and we have to reach out, reach back. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was talking about our women, uh, women in aviation scholarships. I was saying that the way that the women and the young young girls really, you know, postulate is they have to do an interview on the a video interview that first of all they they send to us for us to evaluate. And some of some of the things that you hear, it just it it makes you shake your head. And on the one that on the uh, um, in one in one way, and the other way is it's just sickening you when you think. I, I remember one we've selected. She was out there, you know. She had heard about the you know, pilots, and she went to her guide or guidance counselor uh, in uh, in high school. And high, the guidance counselor, which was a woman, says, "What pilot? That's a man's job. <laughs> Don't do that." You know. So, <laughs> but that happens. So we have to go back and educate from from I think K to twelve is critical. Absolutely. And Maria? 
Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of wonderful programs where we, we make it, you know, we can make a difference, a STEM, uh, first robotics, uh, girls who code, you know, and we, you know, we take an active interest in all of them and they're really great. I think, you know, one of the goals of the, of our women's leadership conference is, you know, has been in the last few years outreach. So we partner with, uh, you know, my colleagues on the panel and other organizations, including E and Y. So outside of our industry, so that we could go and make alliances and, and learn, you know, what could be going on in other industries. So we don't continue this sort of more insular, you know, culture. And I think then we have to reach, you know, several times it's been said this morning, the notion of culture, because it really does come down to that, right? Because most of these programs initiatives, you know, they, 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 they run out of juice. So, you know, you need, it needs to be part of your fabric and getting involved in schools. And I, I'm very, very pleased. And I know that Mark and Denise could say the same thing that, you know, whether I go to a Sontrade event or, uh, you know, Mon Avenir, Ton Avenir, um, you know, somebody will say, oh, there was this one person from Pratt Winnie Canada who led this thing or that thing. So encouraging your people, you know, even in less organic ways to be out there, you know, making a mark. I must say the, the, the I have such vivid recollections of people taking an interest in me as a kid. I remember my sister taking me to the office and sitting, you know, she worked across from PVM. And I knew then I was going to have a corner off. I mean, I'm actually <laughs> a little bit, but I just had that sense. Well, I want something like this, you know, or somebody, you know, my father handing me a drill. I mean, these were all things that, like, I, it's easy to say it in retrospect, but I know that those are the things that tell a kid, wow, you know, like any one of these things is, is good. And I think that's, because you know, as far as engineering is concerned, we've we've increased our more junior population by 10%. That's like 40%. So more than the universities produce, but it doesn't stick. Why? Because some of those women go into more generalist areas. Now that's good. We love it. We want engineers all over our company. But is it because of structural things we're doing? So we're trying really hard to understand that better. Thanks to all of you. Great panel. We've got. Fabulous feedback on all three of you. I think you've got people who are going to be joining your organizations, be knocking at your doors. Okay, go over to you, Caroline. Thank you so much, Nicole. So, again, a huge thank you to the three of you. It's been an absolute delight uh, to have you here. We are looking forward to having you in our events in person when that all uh, resumes again. But in the meantime, we're continuing our Global Leaders for Parity events. Uh, that the next one will be on July 9th, and we will have Monique Lopu and Norm Steinberg. They are the co-chairs of the Women in Governance Board, and uh, we will be talking about, obviously, Monique Lopu's recent uh, nomination by the federal government to lead the economic, um, the, the, the committee for the economic recovery uh, post-pandemic. She's been extremely busy, but she's delighted to uh, to have a chance to speak uh, with, with all our uh, our uh, our members and our auditors and uh, we'll have uh, norm uh, norm steinberg obviously join her he's an unbelievable male champion and uh, a great co-chair uh, of our board uh, alongside monique and um i'm also going to take this opportunity talking about federal nominations i was also i uh, just yesterday so this is so fresh i haven't even uh, announced it publicly yet but i uh, was just uh uh, contacted by the uh, Prime Minister's office for to join uh, the G20 Empower Committee, so representing Canada. It's an initiative that was announced in 2019 at uh, at the G20, and uh, it is intended to build and maintain in each G20 member an alliance within the private sector to uh, identify challenges and to share evidence-based analysis, practical lessons learned, knowledge, and best practices to support the greater recruitment and advancement of women as business leaders. So it's extremely exciting to be a part of this and that it even exists. So I'm uh, very thankful that our uh, government is always um, leading the way on amazing initiatives uh, such as this one. So again, thank you all. Uh, please join us on July 9th at 12 p.m. Eastern time for an hour with uh, Monique Lohu and Norm Steinberg. And uh, stay safe. And we'll be circulating the video of uh, today's conference. So thank you again, Denis Janji, Marc Parent, 
Maria de la Posta, and thank you for everything that Rolls Royce, CAE, and Pratt Whitney does to allow women to progress within your uh, respective organizations.